Hi everyone, my name is Heather Taylor. Um, I think I'm going to try to get us started promptly because we have a lot to cover in an hour. Um, so I want to thank you all for choosing the Path of Citizen Journalism. I think this will be the best panel ever. <laughs> Uh, the Citizen Journalism course is our newest offering. We just launched it this past November, so it's really in its early stages. Um, and as it, as it says here, it's a cure for closed door government. Um, and I want to preface that we're not trying to replace professional journalism if there are any professional journalists in the audience. Really, this is a way to marshal our resources at the local level and citizens and try to fill in where there are coverage gaps and look at what tools are out there so citizens can report from the front lines what's happening in City Hall. Um, just to give you a little uh, framework of how this is going to run, I am going to give a very condensed version of our Citizen Journalism course. Um, as Harry mentioned, all our courses are available online, and the Citizen Journalism one, if you can uh, imagine, is quite more extensive than some of the other courses that we offer, so I try my best to boil down the most important points. Um, I still, I think I'm at like 20 slides, so I'm going to run through them really quick. Um, and then I'm here joined by a great panel, like Peter Leiden, uh, who is a reporter for several years and news director with Esri Park Press, Comcast, um, which we can tell a little bit more about your experience. Ted Mann is here. He's from InJersey.com. He's the founder of that and Gannett News, uh, state director of digital media. <laughs> and John Ward, the founder and publisher and editor, um, and, and, <laughs> and genius behind Red Bank Green, uh, one of our examples of a hyper-local hyper journalist uh, website um, devoted to Red Bank in Monmouth County. Uh, so citizen journalism, let me, as I said, I'm going to run through it, and then after each speaker, um, we'll do some Q&A afterwards and really have open dialogue um, about this. Uh, but citizen journalism, as I said, we're not here to replace professional journalism. We just really want to get citizens out there reporting uh, what's happening. Um, and I see this as more, it's not just simply being a glorified secretary, taking minutes at a meeting and posting them. Um, we would like some thought and consideration giving in to reporting. We want you to be responsible. Um, we want you to be able to discern what's happening in a government meeting, which is why our course, rather than a general journalism course you might take at a university, we really want to give you the tools to how does government function? How can you, sitting at a government meeting, be able to analyze what's happening? Who are the power players behind the decision-making process? Um, so you're not just saying they voted yes on this topic, but they voted yes, and that's interesting because maybe this person you know, had a part to play in that decision. Um, so hopefully, I'm going to go through the different power players right now. Um, uh, again, as I said, not a glorified secretary. Uh, we want you to be able to review, process, and report the news. Um, and I see this as happening at anywhere. Um, be a responsible journalist at a town council meeting, at a school board meeting, um, if you're involved in partisan politics, at party affairs, um, you know, and you can cover things like budgets, government meetings, um, different ordinances that are coming up to be voted on. Um, those are just some examples. And our goal after today is to sort of prepare you to be responsible. So as I said, in our course we go in great detail about what we consider the four power centers. The mayor and city council, planning board and other uh, boards and commissions of the town, the political parties, and the school board. Um, these four power centers are probably the most powerful and most accessible to a citizen journalist. Uh, it's very easy to contact your mayor and city council and report on what they're happening. Um, and it's, um, it's pretty basic, so let me go into the mayor and city council. Um, again, they are a power center because they pass laws and regulations, they spend money and taxes. You know, a big part of uh, the opening uh, talk from Harry was focusing on the cost of government and how it's, the, the cost of government is skyrocketing. Well, 75% of our tax dollars get spent at the mayor and council level. Um, so we need citizens that are on the ground saying, how is this budget going through? How are they spending money? Um, uh, when uh, one of my retired reporter friends, he used to cover the school board sub-budget committee um, back in the day. I don't think that's a bureau that still exists in any of the papers, but I mean, that's the level of detail, and we want to try to replicate that and try to get citizens reporting on, you know, how are they spending money? How are they overseeing the police department? What is the overtime cost? Um, these are 
simple facts that can be ascertained, and we'll go into that a little bit later, um, but that you as a citizen watching a meeting can report then online. Boards and commissions, again, um, there's different types of boards and commissions that have an impact. Um, there's planning board, zoning board, other land use types of boards and commissions, um, constituent services, senior, youth, recreation, and then ad hoc. Um, and at any time, a council can create a new board or commission um, to create their events, or maybe to handle an issue. A lot of towns right now are doing budget review commissions to look, review that year's fiscal budget. Um, political parties. Um, this too might be harder for a citizen journalist to cover because uh, they have freedom of association and sometimes it's hard for journalists to break into what's happening um, at the political party level. But it's important to understand how they are structured. Uh, there's more than 24,000 political party representatives. Um, and I think Harry gave a little bit of overview of that and there's another panel talking about political party. But what's important to know is that they endorse the candidates, they raise the campaign money, and they fill vacancies in public office. And these are the type of stories you might need to be covering as a citizen journalist, especially endorsing candidates. Um, as you might want to cover a local election coming up and interview the candidates and figure out what was the endorsement process that the party used. Um, okay. So now we go into the empowerment laws. Um, these are the four laws that I think are tools for any citizen journalist or any journalist going in to cover <coughs> their local government or the local political parties. Um, and let me just go through each one of them. You're right to know. Um, it's pretty basic. Um, for those not familiar, it's called OPRA, or the Open Public Records Act. And this is a state law which gives you the right to public records. Um, you are guaranteed a right to get it by, within seven days. Um, you may get some documents for free if you go and inspect it in the office. And if they are denying you a record, you are guaranteed free mediation by the Government Records Council. Um, and this is a key law, especially as a citizen journalist, if you don't have anyone on the record, a document that can back up your story will be very important. Um, if you need one, it's someone who's testing your credibility. Um, so it's, it's a very important tool to be a journalist. Your right to attend meetings and speak, also called the Sunshine Law or the Open Public Meetings Act. This guarantees you access to a government body um, or a school board meeting. Um, you must be given notice, there must be an agenda, and the public is guaranteed a right to speak. That's also very important because as a journalist covering a meeting, you need to know that citizens are guaranteed their right to speak at a planning board, their right to interrogate uh, different professionals that are speaking on a plan, um, knowing that a citizen has a right to speak, you'll see if the <coughs> council people try to dismiss them quickly, you'll know that something isn't happening right. Um, this also guarantees that elected officials can't be meeting secretly, and there's been cases of that in New Jersey. They can't be having dinners where they're all together deciding how they're going to vote. Um, this is the law that guarantees your right to know what they're doing behind closed doors. And the Party Democracy Act. Um, this and the next law I'm going to talk about um, are new laws that we actually got adopted. Um, this one is the Party Democracy Act. This guarantees a list of who the county committee people are. Um, as I said before, there are 24,000 positions in the political parties, and you now have a right to call your county clerk and find out who are the county committee people. Um, this, it's important to have that list because the county chair in some places has a big say, but in a lot of instances, the county committee people get to vote. And um, it's important to know who those people are and, and make sure that they are doing their job. Um, they also have the right to a constitution and bylaws. The state law requires that the constitution and bylaws are posted on the county board of elections websites. Um, they're still implementing that, as far as I can tell. They're not all up on the internet. But you can also, if there is an election to fill a vacancy, you can go on your county clerk's website and obtain the constitution and bylaws and make sure that they are conducting party business and selecting people um, according to their constitution and bylaws. Um, and they, I guess, as I said, they fill vacancies. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but one third of our legislature got, by, got into office by way of a vote of the county committee, not by the general public. So that just tells you what, how powerful that is and how important it is to be able to keep an eye and be a watchdog on the parties to make sure that they're operating fairly. And then the Citizen Service Act. 
Um, municipalities must maintain a list of boards and commissions. This was another one of our laws. Um, as I said, a, a, a town could have as few as one board and commission, or they could have as much as 30. Um, this guarantees that you can get access to who are appointed, when are their terms expiring. When we've done studies in towns, we've seen boards, um, like in the city of Newark, they had a senior commission that no one had been appointed since 1995, and this was 2006. <laughs> so over 10 years have lapsed, and we actually worked with them and got it reconstituted. Um, and it also allows you just to enforce who's getting appointed these boards or commissions. Um, by way of having a public directory and having access to who's applied, you could see, is it the most qualified person getting appointed, or is it a cousin of an elected official getting appointed who has no experience and is reward for working on the campaign? Um, that's something you might want to write a story about as a citizen journalist. Um, now I'm going to transfer over into just some very scaled down ABCs of the, of, from the path of certified journalists on just the basics. And um, you all were handed out a guide to news writing. Um, so that sort of covers my journalism 101 of the inverted triangle, who, what, where, and why. Um, and you know, if you'll have that too, we won't go into that. Um, so the basic principles of responsible journalism. Uh, they're pretty standard, I think. Uh, these are things that we would like to see in our press. Uh, accuracy, thoroughness, fairness, independent, and objective. Um, <coughs> You know, for accuracy, as I said, use Open Public Records Act. Um, get a document to back up your story to make sure you're accurate. You know, always cross-check it. You know, if you're reporting on a budget, it's very important to make sure you get your numbers right. Double, triple check what numbers you're reporting. Especially if it goes out on the internet, something like that can go viral. Um, and let me see, thoroughness. It's important to get the whole story. Interview all the community stakeholders. Don't just interview um, the mayor. Interview people from opposing parties interview um, you know, citizens, try to get a citizen's feedback on it, but just try to cover all your bases. Um, fairness, same thing, getting both sides of the story. Um, independent. <coughs> this is, and you know, maybe we talk about this on the hyper-local end, when you're choosing where to report your story, um, to make sure it is an independent, um, fair and objective website. Um, you know, you can do more partisan, uh, you know, if you're blue jersey or red jersey, but there's also websites like in jersey, red fair, <laughs> and red big green. Um, it's important not only what you're writing, but where you post it, because that's going to affect your credibility with your story. And then objectivity. Um, we're really focused on reporting what's happening in government. You could do op-eds that would be more subjective, and we're not really going to get into that. But for us, these are sort of your basic principles of being a responsible journalist. Writing a report, as I said, the guide is in front of you. Um, you know, I, I think you could, your report could be as short as five sentences, a little paragraph, or it could be as much as a thousand word essay on why the master plan is the best thing ever. <laughs> um, it's really up to your discretion, and I'm sure Ted will talk about what they take and Red Bank Green. I mean, it really levels the level of detail you want to report. Um, and with the internet, anything is possible. Um, sample stories. These are just some ideas, and I've already mentioned some of them on you know interviewing boards and commission members. You know, try to go out there and interview people already serving. Um, it's a great profile piece, and you know, my organization we're doing call to service. We want to encourage more public service. So by interviewing someone and sharing their story of why they're involved, you might be able to inspire others to serve. Um, and also, look, are there vacancies? Is there a board? As I said, with the Senior Commission in Newark, we were able to recruit 10 people to then fill those posts and really now start providing services to uh, senior citizens in the community. The municipal budget, um, looking at where is all the money going? What are the property tax increases? Um, those are just uh, basic things. And then the ordinance. Um, if they're proposing a pay-to-play ordinance, uh, what is the impact in the town? Who's for it? Who's against it? What do people say at the public hearing? Um, those are just some ideas, and it's really sky's the limit. Um, and then where can you publish? This is an example. Um, we have, um, I just sort of grabbed a bunch off the internet. We have in Jersey, NJ.com, Newsroom, um, All Voices Patch, um, and there's tons of others, and different companies are springing up. And I'm sure we, we can talk about this more when we get to the panel about publishing on Hyperlocal. Um, and most of them are very easy. Hopefully I did that in record time. <laughs> <laughs>
So answer the call. Um, in your form, there is a gold form, and I really apologize for giving you the condensed um, Speedy Gonzales version. Um, but you can go online to the full course, but um, fill the, for the form, we'll put you in, um, and we'll contact you at other upcoming classes or events. Um, and also, I'm just make a pitch you guys from fans of us on Facebook. <laughs> Since we're in the more tech advanced course. And oops, that's it. So with that, I would like um, no immediate questions right now, hopefully. Okay. Um, if I can, then um, I would like to first have Peter go. Um, he comes to us with years of institutional knowledge of the world of journalism, and I want to thank you for coming. And Peter, would you please start? I'm going to speak a very brief history of the press in the USA, hearing a lot about citizen journalism. And in this day and age, that's kind of a, uh, a foreign concept. Uh, for the last 30 years or so, journalists have come through journalism school has been considered a profession, but that's really a, a, um, a recent development. It's not always been that way. If you go back to the start of our republic in the war, you'll see that it's very different. Uh, by way of background, uh, I have been a newspaper reporter, a radio reporter, um, and then uh, worked the other side of the fence in public and government relations, most recently for Comcast. Uh, for 13 years. Um, so uh, what Heather was talking about, about uh, public meetings and all, I've actually worked, I haven't worked up on the dais, but both sides have been reporting on it. Uh, and I can tell you, you've never lived until you've been on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and reported on ditch commission meetings. They have ditch commissions. It's alluvial plains, flats, full farms. Ditches are very, very important. It's also very, very boring. But it's very important. It had to be reported on. These people were farmers and all, and they needed to know what was being done about the irrigation, the drainage uh, within the counties. Um, and then with Comcast, I was working uh, the other side, sort of the other side of the fence, where I was making presentations and answering questions of journalists. I was making presentations on behalf of the company to uh, municipal franchise, the, the municipalities who were the franchisors. Uh, so I had to know how to deal with that. And one of the things I found in uh, probably about 75 of them that I did over the years I was there, one of the things I found very frustrating, not as a uh, government relations person, because frankly, I was often happy that there was nobody in the audience to ask me questions, uh, but as a citizen, I found it frustrating that uh, so many times there were very few people there, and many of the people who were there were grossly misinformed. You know, they just didn't even know how a council worked. They expected somebody to wave along, snap their fingers, and the mirror snapped his fingers, and it was done. Um, and that's where the role of the journalist was. Uh, up until again, um, the last 20 to 30 years when uh, media uh, companies started consolidating, your local newspaper became part of a chain, they actually had people out of those meetings. And it might, might have just been a stringer, but there was actually people sitting there. You still find that mostly in the weeklies, but for the major dailies and the regional papers, it's a lost thing. Um, and folks, and, and to me, that's one of the reasons why those people either weren't in the audience or when they were in the audience, they had no idea what was going on, what the issues were, or what they could or could not have an effect on it. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's where um, something we've lost, but I think thanks to the efforts of folks like Ted and John and many people like them, we're coming back to citizen journalism again. Journalism, um, the development in this country is like so many other things driven largely by technology. Um, you know, you can take a look at the history of literacy and see how the leaps and bounds have come about, not because of education or whatever, but because of technology. Gutenberg invented the printing press, suddenly everybody could have a piece of paper in their hand or something. Uh, in colonial early republic days, every journalist was a citizen journalist, and nine times out of 10, they were the local printer. There was a guy who owned the press. He was trying to make a buck. Uh, you have a business asset, it's sitting uh, idle half of the day, that's not good. You know, he's printing up flyers and all for other people in town, labels, that kind of thing, but it's sitting idle half of the day. That's not good, you're not making money. So what do you do? You gather the local gossip, you print up a newspaper, you talk to the leaders in the town, the elders in the church, whatever, you print it up and you distribute it. You make a couple of pennies on each one, and more to the point, you're advertising your printing business. You can see what a good print printer you are because you actually put something in their hands. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is probably the one that we all know the best for this. Uh, you know, he, he was a printer, but he also became a journalist, and eventually that led him into 
becoming a political leader because he got involved through that. Um, pre-war, pre-colonial, or pre-revolution, they were usually propagandists. Uh, they printed what were called broadsides. Uh, there was nothing what uh, Heather put up there of a list of what uh, responsible journalists does. They printed lies, rumors, whatever. It was just a way to get the stuff out there. Uh, and typically they had a strong opinion about the thing. Um, the idea of objectivity really is a 20th century idea. Um, it didn't exist at that time. When you printed something up, you had, a, you had an axe to grind. After the revolution, uh, particularly in the major cities, you saw an expansion of this to real newspapers. They rapidly expanded things that were set up not just as a side business for a printer, but an actual newspaper was set up. Uh, they still hewed to a particular point of view. You picked up whatever paper you picked up because you agreed with what they said. Um, and uh, these folks wore it on their sleeves and it was very, very low. Um, partly because there was no mass media at that time. There was no way to find out if you were in New York to find out what was happening, say, in Richmond, Virginia. It would take a couple of weeks before it would make it up there. And besides, the people in New York really didn't care that much. Um, this all changed, and this is the first technological thing that comes in, in the mid-19th century, the 1840s, with the invention of the telegraph. Uh, that initiated a shift in journalism uh, from local journalism, citizen journalism, because suddenly you could get information from Richmond to New York in the blink of an eye or the tap of a key. Uh, people suddenly became interested in what was happening elsewhere. Uh, we saw that then through the next uh, upheavals. In the United States, uh, the Civil War came in part partly because people so suddenly knew what was going on elsewhere, and they knew it almost in real time. Not exactly; it wasn't three three weeks away and twenty different iterations of it. So you weren't really sure whether the information was true by the time it got to you. Um, news and information could be transmitted over uh, great distances. It caused less localism. Um, Newspapers began to carry more national news, sometimes even international news. And it also secondarily made it profitable for larger entrepreneurs to get involved. Before that, it was a, strictly a local thing. Again, your, your local printer or a local entrepreneur or a local writer who set it up, set up a newspaper. Um, Whitman set up a newspaper, set up a couple of newspapers, wrote for newspapers. Um, this, the invention of the telegraph and the ability to aggregate news from area, other areas made it profitable for a large entrepreneur to come in and set up newspapers in different places, share resources among them, uh, folks like the Hearsts and the Pulitzers, late, 20th, uh, late 19th and early 20th century. That was sort of the pattern until the next major technological shift in the early 20th century, which was the invention of radio. Uh, that put a sound to it and it made the newspapers sort of shift, uh, not only in um, the format, but the content. They were competing with someone who could actually put the sound of news on the air. So they had to look for other things to do. One of the ways they did that was give more depth to stories uh, in response to radio and, and newsreels. Then as now, those were often quick sound bite uh, images and the like. Newspapers saw that they could move into it, maybe expand the stories a little bit deeper. That would give it an edge. Followed that by about 20 years later to television. Uh, which was probably the single biggest change up until now uh, that journalism faced. And again, each of these things is taking it further and further away from citizen journalism. Remember back in the early days, it was the guy with the press, the printing press, in his town, he knew people. At this point, when you get to radio and TV, journalists are no longer driving the bus. It's the person who owns the transmitter, who owns the TV station, who owns frequencies. Um, the journalist has become an employee rather than, and Hearst and Pulitzer moved it in that direction with the larger entrepreneurs, but this really solidified it. Um, TV essentially did that. It forced again the newspapers to look in other ways. Ironically, one of the things that happened over time, whereas radio made newspaper stories longer, TV shortened, because it was shortening people's attention spans. So you have things coming up over, over time, like USA Today. Uh, lots of splashy color, shorter stories. That's in, in response to what was happening in the um, uh, television. The next grade, and the one that we're in now, still in the throes of, is obviously the uh, 
the introduction of internet and web-based media. Uh, print and broadcast media, frankly, are still struggling to find their place. It took a long time. You know, it's not, uh, it's not that they're going to die at any time soon, but it takes a long time. You know, we take a look back at what happened with radio and TV, and these are things that happened over time, and this is happening over time now. The internet is a news source that's maybe 10 years old, maybe 15 years old if you want to stretch it. Um, what this has also done, though, besides putting print and broadcast back sort of on their heels again and having to find, is it's bringing us back around to local journalism. Ted and John will talk a little bit more about that now. Um, you're seeing hyper-local and micro-news sites set up, uh, blogging, podcasts. <coughs> Once again, that printing press, for want of a better word, the owner of the printing press is anybody with a computer. And they can go out there and put their information out. Some of them might get uh, traction, most of them won't. Um, or you can find a site, like in New Jersey, Red Bank Green, a patch, without publishing stuff. And what are these folks doing? They're sending people back out to the meetings again, places that uh, the newspapers and television had abandoned as they became larger and more and more institutional. The second thing next to technology that's caused this shift is the rise of the professional journalists. I have a quote here from one of my favorite movies, His Girl Friday. I'm not going to frighten you by doing your Cary Grant impression, but it's a quote here. Uh, saying to Hildy Johnson, who was a star reporter who's going to go off and get married, and also his ex-wife, what you were when you came here five years, what were you when you came here five years ago? A little college girl from a school of journalism. Now, it's interesting, this film was made, I believe, in 34, 35, I could be wrong with that, right around that time. He mentions the school of journalism there. But at that point, journalists were still, it was an apprenticeship for the most part. Somebody came out of high school, or maybe didn't even graduate high school, got a job as a copy boy at the newspaper, followed a reporter around, apprentice to him. Did that for a few years until they started working the night desk or whatever. Worked their way up and learned journalism at the feet of other journalists. Um, the earliest journalists, as we said, were print printers and businessmen. There was no training for a profession. It wasn't even a profession. What you needed was access to a press some semblance of a writing skill, powers of observation, some connections, and a strong opinion, mostly the the latter. Mid-19th century, um, Robert E. Lee, General Lee, before he was a general, established the first program in the United States for teaching journalism at Washington and Lee University. It was just a class, it wasn't a school, but it was a program to teach journalists. Um, at the cusp of the 20th century, early, uh, the early 20th century, the first journalism school in America was set up at the University of Missouri. It was a model that was followed by just about every other journalism school still followed. Um, but even then, through the first half of the century, even though that school had been set up and others in place, you still learned it as an apprentice. That's why I was saying that line from His Girl Friday sort of straddled to. Uh, she came from uh, a school of journalism, but implicit in the line, <coughs> implicit in the films, that she really didn't learn to become a journalist until she joined the Metropolitan Daily, where she was, and that's where she learned to be a journalist. Uh, the 60s and 70s saw the rise of journalism schools, professional education, the same way we see um, <coughs> accountants, other professional. Journalism school became the primary way you became a journalist. Um, it combined technical skills, research, editing, interviewing, and the like, with academic or um, theoretical, uh, theory, ethics, that kind of thing. Um, in turn, this led, in many ways, to a loss of localism. Rather than your journalists coming up from the communities they were writing about, which is the way most of them came from, they came from a journalism school, maybe halfway across the country, or all the way across the country. You probably have seen this in your own local papers. You know, when a new, new reporter comes in, and they write the same story that somebody's written five years ago. Um, and it takes them a few months to really get to know the players. Um, you know, you'll pick up little <laughs> That's not right. Um, so you saw that loss of localism. They had no roots, uh, no ties to the communities they covered, and often they were looking toward the next job. You know, they may come into your community paper, uh, your Ocean County Observer or whatever, but they're looking, no, I don't want to stay at the Ocean County Observer. I want to go to the Ledger, and then I want to get to the Times. 
So they're not looking here as a career in your community, as a community or citizen journalist. This is really just a stepping stone for them. Um, again, as mentioned, this is changing now with the rise of hyperlocalism on the internet. Um, what's happened, though, is we're trying to take the best of both worlds now. Uh, what before we had was a whole lot of localism, a whole lot of people uh, tied to their community and all with absolutely no idea how to be a journalist. <laughs> and they really didn't care. Um, it was about their opinion. <laughs> it shifted in the latter part of the last century to people with all of the theory, all of the ethics, all of the training, but none of the localism. How do you combine these two things? Um, we're seeing it happen in a couple of ways. Uh, consumers of news today are disdaining the idea of segregating. They're looking to the web I think a lot of us don't give them enough credit for knowing what they're reading and what they can do the same. And a lot of them are doing it, particularly generations younger than myself. Uh, you know, I look at my son and always picking up his information from a lot of different places. So you're looking now on the web, a few different ways of delivering news are coming up. Aggregators like the Drudge Report. I mean, one of, to me, one of the greatest ideas on the internet is a single page. It's been a single page since it started. One page, black and white text, just a whole lot of links to everything. Um, he's got a point of view, but when you start digging down into those links, he doesn't care whether it comes to the Washington Post, the New York Times, whatever. It's in there. It, it covers the news. So people are picking it up like that. You know, you go to the Drudge Report, and you can sample 20 newspapers from around the world with your, your coffee in the morning. could never do that. Uh, opinion pages and mega bloggers like Huffington Post, American Thinker, Daily Cause, Michelle Malkin. They're delivering news as well, but probably more the way that the early citizen journalists saw. Going back to straight opinion. These are sites that have an idea to stick to it. Um, local cable and radio, uh, don't discount that. Um, every, not every cable system, but the majority of cable systems I speak from experience have public access channels. There is a place for a citizen journalist in most cases. Now your bigger town, say if you're in Jersey City, mm, that's filled up. But most cable systems, there's space. And if you've got a camera, somebody's got a good camera and all, you can, you can do a news show for them. And they're looking for this kind of stuff. So don't discount that. It's out there. Um, cable's in, say, 60%, 55 to 60% of households. That's a lot of people you're reaching there, probably more than the local newspapers. Uh, podcasts, webcasts, and social media, where those come out, whether they actually become a real news source or remain sort of in the opinion, that's still still happening. And finally, and probably most important, are hyper-local news sites. These are the things that are taking the place uh, of what local newspapers used to do. Go out and cover the planning board, cover the school board meeting, figure out what's in that tax document, figure out what the mayor means when he said this people that have ties to their communities, um, an interest in the community, an interest in reporting, an interest in being involved. That's the most important thing that they're doing now. What they have to do um, is balance, again, the professionalism that came into journalism in the second half of the 20th century with the localism that came before. We might be going into a golden age of journalism now because of that. The pendulum was too far one way, it swung too far the other way. This really gives us the opportunity now to sort of find that equilibrium where we have the best of both worlds. Again, consumers show they can distinguish real reporting. And uh, so that means you can't just sort of slap something up on the web and expect that people are going to follow it. The best news sites might be the ones that end up relying on citizen journalists but still have a strong editorial presence to ensure accountability, accuracy, and ethics. Keep it close to the ground while remaining standards. And I think that uh, both uh, Walter Burns and Ben Peck were <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Um, <laughs> that was a perfect intro to Ted Mann, who is, uh, he represents uh, in Jersey, which is owned by Gannett Newspapers, who's based out of uh, the Courier Post headquarters. And so it is that melding of professional and citizen journalists. So without any further ado, Thanks. Thanks so much for teeing it up. Uh, <laughs> this is Walter Burns, by the way. Let's be Walter Burns. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, as Heather said, uh, I work for the Gannett newspapers. Um, we have uh, six newspapers in New Jersey. 
Asbury Park Press, uh, Courier Post, I'm sorry, I remember them all. The LA Record, <laughs> Courier News, Home News Tribune, um, all across the state. And uh, 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 this, um, the reason I'm here today, though, is actually uh, not really to talk about about those uh, those newspapers or their websites, um, um, which I help run, but to talk about uh, in Jersey, which is a new website that we launched about a year ago. Um, it's our hyper local. Uh, website and actually before I go any further we've been throwing that word around just a quick show of hands anybody here know have a definition for what hyperlocal is or know what it is has anyone here ever heard that word before I've heard it I'm sorry. anybody anyone? okay okay sorry you raise your hand I signed up to be on it for buying where I'm from but I oh, haven't really yeah. used it yet okay. <laughs> oh I know the words but I don't know the only context of what it means what it can do Okay, well, well, how odd, would you, odd versus hyper -local, yeah. from what you've seen so far on the Vineland and Jersey site, like how would you, uh, what, what, what would you term hyper local if you had to give it a definition? I guess uh, more relevant with a quicker you know, synopsis of what is going on and that someone looks at it. Right. In a particular town or the area. Right, just, just for that one town or community. Um, anyone else want to chime in the definition? We need, to, we need a Wikipedia entry for hyperlocal. There are already one. Because uh, it's, it's something that confuses everybody, I think, because it's, it's this buzzword that's emerged in the last year. Um, and you know, both John site and the in Jersey say fall under, I think, the umbrella of hyperlocal. Um, and, uh, and, and we're still trying to sort of figure out exactly what, uh, what shape it will take. There are a lot of different models for hyperlocal sites. Um, so I'll just, I'll just throw out a, a few examples. Has anyone here ever heard of a, um, a site called patch.com? Um, so patch is a really interesting thing. It's, a, it's, it's owned by AOL. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of like in Jersey, except it follows the old media model of actually having reporters and editors uh, writing almost all the content. Um, there's really not much of a citizen journalist element on patch. I mean, they, they do solicit some story tips and stuff like that. Um, but patch is like one example. There's a, um, I think you, I would call that like sort of the old uh, model or, or old media model. Um, there's sites like, has anyone here ever heard of Every Block or Topics, uh, Outside In? Uh, I'm just throwing around a bunch of examples. These are sites that basically act as aggregators, right? So that's that, that what I would, I would call it the second model of hyperlocal sites, the aggregator site. And, and those sites do oftentimes um, uh, harness the power of citizen journalists because they go and they fetch links to all those all those sites, like uh, Outside In is a good example. They, they basically they map all the content, um, uh, you know, on citizen journal sites and also on on, on, on traditional media sites. Um, so, so there's the aggregator. Now, next is is what I would call the uh, you know the, the full time citizen journalist um, uh, sites like John's, you know, where where you've got a a, a really um, dedicated, interested uh, resident who has um, started up. You, usually, their blogs. Uh, um, they started up a blog entirely devoted to their to their town or community. Um, one of the most well known of these in New Jersey, at least, is uh, aside from John's, is is, is Barista Net. Has anyone here ever heard of Barista Net? So Barista Net is a great one if you're, right, if you're taking notes. You know, as all good journalists should, uh, you know, write that one down. Um, it's just how it sounds. Barista Net, like you know, like as if it has something to do with coffee, which it doesn't. <laughs> it has, it's, 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 it's a site dedicated to Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, it started up by a woman named Debbie Gallant, but it's 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 basically just started up as a community blog, just following everything about about Montclair and just stayed with it, doggedly reporting any anything from the local PTA meetings to fires in the town to new businesses, you know, uh, you know, checking out the new salon and restaurants, and uh, it's built up quite a following um, over the years. And what what really intrigued me um, when I started working uh, for, for the Gannett Papers, and I think has intrigued a lot of, of media people, is that sites like hers do a, oftentimes a much better job covering local news than newspapers. Um, you know, you look at the start, the, Montclair, New Jersey is right in the heart of Star Ledger territory, and quite frankly, she is kicking their butt. And I think that they would be the first to admit that she is kicking their butt because they've actually taken to actually to reverse publishing content from her site in the paper. Um, and it's just, you know, she just day in, day out has more news about that community and it's become this go-to site. If you live at Montclair, um, at least so the people that, that do live there tell me, um, you go to her site every day and you like live on it. And the same is true of Red Bank Green. And I'll be the first to admit that Red Bank Green is kicking the Asbury Park Press's ass 
um, covering Red Bank, uh, because John just goes at it from every angle, covers all of the news in the town, is out there, first on the scene, photographing, uh, shooting video, doing everything that you need to do to really cover a town well. So, I'm getting, getting to what, <laughs> what I bring to this equation. Um, the uh, um, sites like, 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 like Barista and Red Bank Green really, uh, we have a lot of younger reporters at the, at the papers who were excited to try and see if we could do that too. Um, you know, these are, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, kids just out of day school, J school who didn't want to yet, like, you know, sort of admit that we couldn't play in that same, in that same arena. So uh, we assembled a team um, uh, across the state uh, to, to launch a website called Injury, uh, I N J E R S E Y dot com, and uh, and we're uh, our approach is what I would maybe term the fourth model for hyperlocal, which is the uh, pro am model. Um, so we're we're our site, in addition to having um, full time reporters and editors working on it, we also have made the site fully open to public registration, so that anybody can come and join and contribute. So if you go through this, uh, this wonderful course, by the way, which I've, I've, I've gone on, one I've taken, and I highly recommend everybody um, check it out. Uh, when you're done with it, you, know, you need some place to publish your, your content. And you can start up your own hyperlocal blog. You, know, you could even you know, go at it uh, as a full-time job, like John has. Or if you're not looking at it quite as, as, as that big an enterprise, um, you just want a, a place where you can really quickly and easily publish it online and maybe have a, hopefully a little bit of fun while you're doing it. Um, that's, a, that's why we created the New Jersey site. So we launched um, initially in, in seven towns. We're actually expanding into a bunch of towns. We just expanded to Woodbridge and, and, and Morris, New Jersey this last week. Um, and uh, the way it works is you go to the NJersey.com, you'll see a little like sign up uh, button on the site. And when you register, uh, you have the option to join the community blogs, and then you also have the uh, option to join a community group. Um, it's a kind of a possibly confusing distinction, but most of the groups are labeled something like Freehold Citizen Journalists. Um, so if you join the Freehold Citizen Journalist group, what's cool about that is that when there are, you know, school board meetings or town, you know, uh, you know, some of the people in the town government are reviewing some piece of legislation. Um, we send out a little, our, our site editors oftentimes will send out little notifications to all the people who are on that group saying, hey, can anybody cover this? Or is anybody interested? And uh, those aren't published as, uh, you know, as actual posts or articles on the site. They're just sort of, uh, um, they're like, it's almost like a message form, if you will. Um, and uh, so when you sign up, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there are both those options to join. And you don't have to actually, you know, um, join to become a full-time contributor or you know or you don't have to join that group for that matter if you don't want to you have the option to join both um, and they both sort of carry different uh, different levels of publishing ability um, there's a lot of tools on the site that explain how all this works um, so sir if you, if you join the violence site and you need help uh, you know I'll be around after this uh, and you know uh, you can you know grab a hold of me I'll walk you through how to do it um, my email is also just if you want to write this down it's a Ted at injersey.com. One D in Ted, by the way. And yeah, and that's pretty much my spiel. But I'll turn it over to John now to talk about what it's like to actually make a living doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the, the history lesson. Okay? And, uh, and I'm sorry for Pete and, and, uh, and Ted's uh, perspective on the I'm going to presume that that most or some of you are here because you either want to publish local news um, on your own or contribute in some way to local coverage. Um, uh, I, I, I sort of have to disabuse uh, people of, of, of some misimpressions about Red Bank Green. Um, one is that it's not citizen journalism, uh, except for the fact that I am a citizen of the town I happen to cover. And I think it makes an enormous difference to the way I cover it. Um, um, and we also don't take uh, material from any, nothing is published in Red Bank Green that either I have not written or I've edited. Uh, and I only edit material that comes from people who I want to work with on a daily basis. I don't take one-off stories, oh, I want to do a feature story about my teacher, or the woman talking so I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in people 
uh, who aspire to do real journalism and preferably have journalistic experience. Um, but I think that my experience in creating and building Red Bank Green does offer some models and I hope some encouragement to some of you folks and I'm, I'm hoping to help anybody with any questions that they might have about how to do it. I, I thought it might be uh, might be enlightening to talk a little bit about my experience. I am a professional journalist. I have been a journalist my entire career. I'm 53 years old. I uh, worked in daily journalism at three different newspapers, including the Asbury Park Press for seven and a half years, <coughs> excuse me, and then the uh, Star Ledger for four years. And um, I went into freelance journalism, writing for magazines for about six years, when I was, as I tell people, hit by lightning when I had this idea to create this hyper-local site. I didn't know anything about publishing on the web. I don't, I still, I'm not quite certain of my skills about with, with Photoshop and resizing a photograph and things like that. Um, but I was reading, uh, I'm a, an avid reader of New York Magazine, and back in, I think it was March of 2006, they did a cover story on blogging. And blogging is something that absolutely just turned me off. I had no interest whatsoever in people who were sitting in all of their pajamas with a bottle of gin next to them, <laughs> counting their opinions in the computer. Um, but something drew me to this, this, this package of stories that they had in this magazine. And flipping through it, I found myself really drawn to it. And what I was particularly drawn to was a mention of Barista, Barista Net, also known as Barista of Bluefield Avenue up in Montclair. Um, when I saw that, it was like that. I knew I had to do it. Um, for a while, I had been walking around Red Bank, um, seeing things that I wasn't seeing in the local newspapers, and I could not understand why, and it really frustrated me. I lived in, in Red Bank for, for over a decade. Um, I was not particularly involved in the community, but uh, I'd say, well, that's a story, and that's a story. And occasionally I would go to a council meeting and I would read the coverage and I would think, what, what's, what, what meeting was this reporter at that I didn't see this, or this is not capturing what I saw? Um, so that was a source of frustration, but I didn't quite know what to do with that. Even though I had worked in journalism my entire career, you would think I would have the answer, but I didn't. I was always thinking along the lines of print, and print is a very expensive proposition. So when I heard about Barista, I went to the site, I saw that it was local news, over the backyard fence kind of talk. They were talking about stories about the way people talk about stories, the way neighbors talk about politics, and the way neighbors talk about the new paint store on the corner, and all that stuff. And I, was, I also saw that it was full of advertising, which meant that somebody was making a living. And I thought that, that's when it hit, that it, it hit me, that I had to do it in Red Bank before I was going to see somebody else do it before me, and I was going to regret it. So that, that minute I decided to do this without knowing exactly how to do it. And I'm glad I didn't think about it because if I thought about it, I would have talked myself out of it. <laughs> but um, I, I did not start, and I imagine most of you come to this with sort of a political uh, focus. I, I'm, I'm not a political guy. I'm not, I've never been really all that interested in politics. And frankly, I was interested more in human stories, the untold human stories of people who lived in our community, who, who did what for a living, why they did it, and what sort of values that, re, that emerged from what they did for a living, and how it was reflected in the community. <coughs> um, that's sort of a, a gauzy way of putting it. But I was interested in what people do for a living, among other things, but not particularly politics. So we started, my wife and I started this, and I say my wife and I because she's a graphic artist, and I shanghai her into doing this. <laughs> Uh, I dragged her kicking and screaming into it to create a, a, a masthead for me, and I said that, that would be the end of it. You, you, you create a masthead, <laughs> you create a masthead, and if I have to draw stick figures of people <laughs> to depict what happened at a council meeting, that's what I'm going to do. She, 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 that was never going to fly. So she, you know, she kept uh, having to impose her perfectionist standards on things, so she got drawn into it. Um, eventually, we, we launched this thing on June 1st, 2006. Um, I, I, I have to boast a little bit and say that right out of the box it was a beautiful website and still I think we have a, a very, uh, I call it a, a lush, a visually lush website. 
Um, we take lots of big pictures. We don't, we don't have lots of little things all over the web page that people can't find. They don't know where to look and can't quite make out without you know, holding their glasses out. It's big type. It's just three columns. It's all very prominent. And it looks really good. But it's, first and foremost, it's driven by content. It's about it's stories that are uh, written from the, the perspective of, uh, I hope, somebody who lives in, in town without a political agenda, with, whose first and foremost interest is in telling stories. Um, I didn't want to do politics, I said. When we launched, launched the site, we actually stupidly uh, launched it as a weekly publication. Because it, it was just so much, it was just so, so, uh, so much of a labor-intensive project to get anything done. And after the first six weeks, we managed to, to, uh, to uh, meet Debbie, who had launched Barista, uh, and her partner Liz, and went up to Montclair to have coffee with them to get some advice. And the first thing Liz says, when, as we're sitting down at the table, she said, so how often are you updating your site? And I said, once a week. She said, you're dead. <laughs> you are dead. It's like people come to your site, it hasn't changed since the last time they think you died and that somebody lost the key to your, your, your house. <laughs> you have to update it more, more frequently. And that was on, a, I think, on a Thursday. And I looked at my wife driving home and I said, we have to do something. <laughs> and uh, that night I wrote my first uh, breaking news story. And it's been hell ever since. It's just, um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's one thing that I, I think that uh, you have to be realistic about if you want to get into this. That it's hard work. <coughs> you, can, you can follow an outline as to how to do reporting and how to write a story. But when, when you've gone, you know, you worked all day at your job, or you've taken care of your kids all day, and then you go to the council meeting, and there are 40 things on the agenda, and then you go home and you're wolfing down a cold dinner at 9.30 and you want you, you have to get your story written in time to post it first thing in the morning because otherwise it's no good to anybody. It's, it's old news. That's where, that's where your metal gets tested. What is the first word? What is the first sentence you're going to write? Some people it comes more easily to, but it's a very difficult job. It's hard work. I want you to understand that. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not playing a violin here. I'm just telling you that that's, that's the way it is. I've been doing this for 25, 30 years, and it's still hard. Um, but you can do it. You can be selective. You can say, this is, this is what I want to follow, and this is what I want to bring to it. I would encourage you to adopt the conventions of, of traditional journalism, which have to do with objectivity. objectivity. Don't bring your own biases to it. You can bring perspective, you can bring cheekiness. I think it's really important to have, a, back, back to the point about perspective, every story that we write, we try to have a little sentence of perspective in it. And perspective can be a subjective thing. We had a story last night about a planning board meeting that was all about one thing, what the planning board was doing. But the vote was really a reflection of the political power, to some degree, of the mayor. Turned out that the planning board voted against the mayor. The zoning board had voted against the mayor. And so there he was sitting there on his hands. And it was the perspective sentence in that story is the mayor is isolated by these two boards on this issue. It doesn't, it may not be the end of the world. It may not mean, you know, be all and end all, but it was worth putting in there. Um, so we, we, do, we do bring a little bit of, uh, of attitude and a little bit of experience to these sort of things. And I didn't do it to, to you know, beat up on the mayor, but to say, you know, this is, this is the situation. Um, Red Bank Green is also a business. And if you want to get into, a, get into that aspect of it, uh, you're really taking on a lot. But I'd be happy to talk to you about that sort of thing as well. But we do have, we do have advertisers. I do have uh, an ad saleswoman now. And, um, and I, I, I don't think it's boasting to say that Red Bank Green is one of the more more successful hyper-locals in the country. Um, we don't have very many true hyper-local, uh, uh, successful, financially successful uh, hyper-local sites in New Jersey at the moment. Um, that includes the patch ones, by the way. <laughs> patch by the way, owned by AOL. If you go to the, 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 the patch sites for Maplewood and 
Cranford and one or two other towns, they don't have a single ad or maybe uh, they have one or yeah. two ads on them. So you know, they, they keep talking about becoming profitable this year. So they're gonna have to pull a rabbit out of the hat. But Red Bank Green has lots of ads and sometimes more than the Asbury White right? <laughs> <laughs> Park. Not, 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 not that we can charge uh, that kind of money, but uh, we're doing okay as a business. And we're gonna do really well this year, I hope. Uh, I, I have a freelance journalist who I work with and I am doing everything in my power to keep happy because I can only pay him peanuts, so I buy him lunch every time I get a chance <laughs> and uh, take him out to dinner with his girlfriend, that sort of thing. Um, we are making a difference. We got into covering politics really because it was an election year, mayoral election year, and I realized Nobody knew anything about the two mayoral candidates. I mean, one guy had been around for a million years, the other guy had been around for a million years, but nobody really knew who they were. And I wanted to know, what is, what is, their, what is your living room look like? You know, who do you live with? What is your life like? What do you do for a living? Who are you? So I sat down and I did these, these two lengthy interviews with these guys in their homes. And uh, I wrote magazine length. They were enormous stories from the web. They were 2,000, 2,500 word stories, just enormous. <laughs> Um, but they made an enormous difference. People, for the first time, understood who these guys were, had some insight into who they were. And so, uh, just a matter of months, and then, then we got caught, into, caught up into covering the, the, the election, and, and, and it was all over, you know, I was sucked in, so I'm doing politics now. But um, at, a, at a conference, very much like this one, about, it happened to be about hyperlocal journalism at Brookdale Community College, just a few months after we launched, the room was packed, and a state legislator stood up and said, one day there was no such thing as Red Bank Green, and the next day it had changed the landscape, the political landscape in Red Bank, like that. And I think, you know, that was very heartening to me, but I hope it's heartening to you, that you can re you realize that you can make a difference. And I would hope that that you do that, and I would like to help you.